GE and CNBC TV 18 present Energizing India. Hello and welcome to our special series, Energizing India. I'm Shireen Bhan. India needs to march towards becoming energy self-sufficient to meet its burgeoning demand for oil and gas, failing which its current account deficit will reach unsustainable levels and the economy will be at a risk of collapse. A robust and coherent policy that supports investments in projects along with technology acting as a catalyst can enable India to overcome its energy crisis. So how can the country meet its challenges in the oil and gas space? To discuss all of that and more, I have with me an esteemed set of panelists, Banmani Agarwala, President and CEO of South Asia, G, Vipul Tali, Director McKinsey and Company, SC Tripathi, former Oil Secretary, Vikram Singh Mehta, Chairman of the Brookings India Institute, who also joins us from Mumbai, and P. Lango, CEO of Kane India. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here on this show. But before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at what went right and what went wrong in the last decade. To meet the burgeoning demand for oil and gas, the Directorate General of Hydrocarbons has outlined the Hydrocarbon Vision 2025. One of the major initiatives under this was the opening up of the hydrocarbon market so that there is free and fair competition between the public sector enterprises, private companies and other international players, thus aiming to reduce imports by 50% by 2020, 75% by 2025 and eventually achieve self-sufficiency by 2030. But to encourage private and foreign investment, the government needs to get its policy on exploration in place. DGH acted as the nodal agency for the implementation of New Exploration Licensing Policy or NELP, which was conceptualized by the Government of India during 1997 to 1998 to provide an equal platform to both public and private sector companies in exploration and production of hydrocarbons. Before implementation of the new exploration licensing policy or NELP in 1999, a mere 11% of Indian sedimentary basins were under exploration, which has now increased extensively over the years. Nine rounds of NELP have been completed till now. The private or joint venture companies contribute about 46% of gas and 16% oil to the national oil and gas production. The Mangala fields in Rajasthan and Krishna Godavari basins have been the major source for oil and gas. However, NELP hasn't been the game changer for the sector that it was expected to be. As only 16 of the awarded have been developed so far, as well as the dwindling output from these blocks has further intensified the problem. The country has an estimated sedimentary area of 3.14 million square kilometers, comprising 26 sedimentary basins. As per the statistics of the Directorate General of Hydrocarbons or DGH, at the end of FY 2010-2011, about 34% of this total sedimentary area was either unexplored or poorly explored. So the need of the R is to tap this huge potential for hydrocarbon discoveries by a well thought out policy on exploration coupled with advanced technology to tap unexplored basins. Well, that in a nutshell tells you where we currently stand today and where we need to be. Before I get into specifics, uh, let me start by asking our panelists about the current situation. Vikram Mehta, let me start by asking you, do you believe in that sense 2013 has been a turning point? Because for perhaps the very first time, the government has tried to address the disease and not the symptoms that ail this sector. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we give credit where credit is due. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt the government has taken some very important incremental steps. But uh, we should also recognize that I don't think it had any other alternative. The fact of the matter is that the oil companies were facing an under-recovery, which is a euphemism of loss, of a pro a between 150 to 175,000 crores. Uh, this was completely unsustainable. The fact of the matter is that if the fiscal deficit needed to be put under control, we would have to bridge this gap between the price of, uh, mm. at which we buy or the cost at which we buy and the price at which we sell uh, petroleum products. So I'm, I, I think what the, the, the formula of incremental sort of price increases and the capping of LPG cylinders is one that is politically feasible. It is also something that was inevitable. But unfortunately, I have to say that this has come, a, this has come too yeah. late, late in the game. Yeah. There's been a lot of investment that has not taken place 
because of the losses incurred by these companies. Uh, Mr. Tripathi, let me come to you. As the former oil secretary, would you agree that while it's a step in the positive direction, it is perhaps, as Vikram Mehta was pointing out, too little, too late. Investor confidence has been hurt so badly, specifically with regards to the oil and gas sector, and that's because we've sort of gone back and forth as far as policy is concerned. Hence, this is an issue, this is a sector that needs to be dealt with, needs to be addressed on an urgent basis, and I hope committees or another committee is not the answer because that certainly seems to have been the problem. It is too little, too late. And uh, let us uh, look at the overall energy scenario and then place hydrocarbon sector. Hydrocarbon, India is not very rich in hydrocarbon deposits. According to geologists, we have only about 1% of global reserves. So while we should do our utmost to find hydrocarbons here and have policy parameters mm. which encourage risk capital and best technology to explore and produce, I think we should go outside also and uh, acquire oil assets, yeah. explore and produce, and we should focus on coal and nuclear as well, because with the best intentions and with best policies, we'll continue to be a major importer of hydrocarbons. I don't believe we can ever become self-sufficient in hydrocarbons. Okay, that's a good point that you're making. I'll come to that in just a bit. But let me also get in uh, Banmani Agarwala into this conversation. Mr. Agarwala, do you believe that at this point in time we're better positioned? We may not get to the DGH Vision 2025, but at least we're better positioned in terms of being able to attract critical technology as well as critical foreign direct investment. Well, certainly things are better than they were before. I think there's a realization that we need to do exploration over here. What we also need to understand is that high technology also comes with its own cost, and yeah. therefore it needs to reflect in pricing in one way or the other. The second is about scale. I think when we talk about exploration and we compare India with other parts of the world, unless and until we do things on scale, we will not be able to attract the best of technologies, the best of people to come and work over here and, get, and make investments out here. On and both those issues, on scale as well as pricing, at least as far as pricing is concerned, do you feel better today than you did 12 months ago? Because oh, yes. there have been changes that have been made, especially as far as gas is concerned, for instance. Certainly, I feel much better. And with the recent decision of the cabinet to increase the gas price, I think that's, that's a sign in the right direction. It should hopefully spur further investment, which is so desperately needed in the sector. Uh, and I think if we are able to show scale, I would even argue that manufacturing and technology companies would look at setting up base in India for the purpose of further localization mm. because they see a clear opportunity over here over an extended period. And I think that is the opportunity that we really what need to What could come in the way of that? It's, again, it's scale relative to other countries, other regions in the world. The other part, of course, is about skills and trained people. This is a sector that takes in a lot of investment, but if you look at the skills and trained people that are available, I think they're really scarce. Mm. So we need to put in some effort over there as well. And my sense is that if we can show the, the opportunity, mm. all this will fall into place. On that note, we'll take another quick break, but when we return, we continue our conversation here on Energizing India, brought to you in association with GE. GE and CNBC TV 18 present Energizing India. Welcome back. You're watching our special series Energizing India. We're discussing the future of the hydrocarbon sector in India. People, you know, uh, we, can, we can sort of classify ourselves as pre-NELP and post-NELP. Even the success with regards to NELP hasn't really been the way that, uh, hasn't matched up to our objectives and our aspiration. The government is now looking at launching NELP 10. Uh, do you really believe that we will find enough takers, there will be enough appetite given where we are today? You know, first of all, I think these are steps in the right direction uh, that have been taken. Uh, the other thing that's really happened in the last three or four months is that a number of uh, MC decisions that had been pending, in yeah. fact, almost, I think, uh, maybe 150 of them. For have, the benefit have, of the uninitiated, MC is the management committee. So, all right, uh, go <laughs> ahead. But, but as you look at the upstream, uh, these were really, uh, uh, you know, stalling investment and stalling decisions on existing fields. They've literally been cleared down from 150 down to zero. Okay. So that's, that's certainly a step in the right direction. Uh, it's difficult to say what will happen with NELP 10, NELP 10 or 11, but I think uh, to, to get to investment in the kind of technologically challenging environment that we're talking about, four things need to be in place. Mm. One, clear competitive access to acreage. Two, real support to make 
national, strong national players, whether they're foreign, whether they're Indian, but strong national players and ecosystems, uh, not just in, in developers, but service companies and so on. Third, making sure that the fiscal regime actually evolves given the risk return profile that we have. Mm. And fourth, finally, we just don't have enough uh, uh, support on R&D. It's coming, but we do, uh, s some of the technological challenges we have really do need uh, a much greater focus on innovation. Uh, so for instance, some of the things that we are trying to do on, uh, on our offshore carbonate reservoirs are things that haven't been done anywhere in the world. Hmm. So making those happen does re require real technology development in the country. Okay, so we'll address each of those issues in just a bit, but let me quickly get in P. Lango of Kane in on this conversation as well. Mr. Lango, what's your take on the role that's actually been played by NELP in the past and how has that changed the dynamics of the sector? Overall, I believe NELP has played a very positive role in the Indian oil and gas upstream sector. Uh, if you look at the statistics before NELP regime came into being, roughly about 11 percent of the sedimentary basin alone was under what we call active exploration. Uh, post the NELP launch, today roughly about 47 percent of the sedimentary basin is under active exploration. This uh, 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 means more players have come into the, into the sector, uh, roughly about 20 billion dollar investment has happened in the sector due to NELP. I think NELP has uh, managed to attract more player in, into the sector. Uh, uh, if I were to answer the question honestly, has it got all the kind of players that you would like to have in India? The answer is no, but I think it is a good beginning that where you find smaller players as well as bigger companies like BP has managed to come into this country and play a role in the developing the sector as a whole. Well, some of the big guys have come in, some have actually also exited. So, Mr. Elango, where has India gone wrong as far as policy initi initiatives in exploration are concerned? And what are the global examples that perhaps we can learn from? The first thing we should do is to set up what we call the National Data Registry. Uh, what it does is collect all the data around the geological basin of this country and put it in one area. Uh, which will promote then uh, around the year bidding, what we call open acreage bidding, uh, which is uh, the norm today followed by many other countries in the world. Number two is to really, uh, you know, uh, drop this distinction between conventional gas, unconventional gas. At the end of the day, the country needs more hydrocarbon molecule. Uh, therefore, every acreage holder should be encouraged to explore for any molecule which is uh, appears in any form. The third is for this sector to really succeed, we need a very robust oil services sector. Just to give you an example, uh, upstream as a whole globally attract investment of roughly 600 billion dollar per year. Uh, what is the share of India in that? Uh, out of the 600 billion dollars, roughly about 300 billion dollars is, is attracted by the oil services sector. Today India does not have a robust oil services sector. I think as a country we must encourage the development of oil services sector. Finally, uh, at the end of the day when these risk investment are made, uh, all the investors would require one thing that the commodity that they produce whether it is oil or gas should get a market determined price as such. Uh, if we do these three things, I am sure you would be able to attract much more investment. All right, uh, on that note, I think it's a good opportunity for us to actually take a break. When we return, we are going to discuss the opportunities for exploration in India's oil and gas sector and, of course, talk about whether the DGH's vision statement 2025 is a tad too optimistic. All of that and more when we return on this special show, Energizing India. GE and CNBC TV 18 present Energizing India. Welcome back. You're watching our special series, Energizing India. We're talking about the future for India's hydrocarbon sector. Vikram Mehta, you know, before the break, we were talking about uh, India pre-NELP and post-NELP. We were talking about the policy imperatives. But let me start by asking you about this DGH vision statement that's been put out for 2025, cutting imports by 50% by 2020, 75% by 2025, and eventually being self-sufficient by 2030. Do you really believe this is disconnected from reality, or do you think we 
do have a shot at getting there. Clearly, if we were to go on the basis of history or historical trends, then the DGH vision seems rather optimistic. On the other hand, there are enough examples around the world, and including in India, to show that uh, technology can unearth uh, huge quantities of hitherto undiscovered, undiscovered reserves. So I'm not going to say it's unrealistic. I'm just going to say it's a huge challenge. And I hope that we will be able to actually achieve at least part of those, uh, those, those aspirations. The real issue, I think, is, is to ensure that we recognize the realities today. It's not so much what the reality will be in the future, it's the reality today. The reality today is that our hydrocarbon sector has actually, to some extent, vitiated the operating environment. The policy, the administrators of this sector have made in investment in the exploration and production of hydrocarbons very difficult. And unless we do something dramatic yeah. to change the investment sentiment, we're not going to be able to attract the kind of money that's required. We're not going to be able to, able to attract the technology that's required to achieve those, those, those aspirations. Uh, Vipul, let me come to you on what can be done immediately, as Vikramatha is talking about. You know, we've had several committees actually look at recommendations and prescriptions for the sector, the last one being the Rangarajan Committee. And production sharing contracts uh, mired in controversy. Uh, you were talking about how fiscal policy, in a sense, needs to incentivize investments into the sector. Moving away from cost recovery to revenue sharing, and that is the recommendation of the Rangarajan Committee as well, do you believe that that could perhaps, in a sense, start to to create a more investor-friendly atmosphere, investor-friendly climate as far as the sector is concerned? India's basins have a certain risk-reward uh, uh, associated with them. So, for instance, if we look at our onshore and our, some of our shallow, uh, shallow offshore uh, basins, uh, they are relatively lower risk and, uh, you know, we can, we can uh, try, uh, try more forward-looking policies there. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if we are looking at... Um, uh, deep water yeah. and some fundamentally newer types of plays, uh, then it may be uh, a more uh, beneficial to talk about policies which are, which actually uh, cover more of the risks for the for the investors. If I look at what Norway has done, for instance, uh, what they managed to do is they they have realized that uh, a large part of the oil and gas has to come from redevelopments of of existing fields. Mm. Uh, and this is a, a piece that we, we often uh, uh, don't focus as much on. Of sure. course, we have to do exploration, we have to do more on unconventionals, but the existing fields, we have to make sure that the massive amounts of money that need to go into, for instance, redeveloping uh, the Western Offshore, Bombay High, and so on, has to be remunerative. So whatever we do, we have to recognize the risk and the reward of, of different basins and make sure that those, uh, the, those are uh, compensated. Uh, Mr. Agarwala, in terms of priorities at this point in time, you know, taking forward what both Vipul and Vikram Mehta were talking about, how do we actually get to that vision 2025? You have oil and gas sector today booming pretty much all across the world, mm. right? And therefore, people have choices to make, both in terms of exploration, both in terms of technology and, and all of that. So therefore, we need to present the opportunity in the right perspective for people to really believe that here is a place where we can come and invest over the long term. The other point I'd make is, one is the exploration piece, but then the infrastructure required to take oil and gas and distribute it down to the, mm. to the consumer end is also something which is extremely crucial. I don't think we've paid enough focus or attention to get that in place, especially when it comes to, to let's say, gas. Uh, and if you look at gas, for example, I mean, today we have a skewed consumption of diesel yeah. as opposed to gas, A, because of pricing and also because of lack of a proper distribution network. Yeah. And I think we need to begin to fix all of these and not just stay focused entirely on the exploration end. SC Tripathi, uh, you know, one of the big concerns and challenges which perhaps has not been addressed convincingly so far is on the regulatory front. Uh, we've often talked about the DGH and we were talking about management committees and management committees not meeting and, and clearances being held up and weather windows being lost and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, the need for a truly independent regulator, is that too much to ask for? So we don't have a proper regulator downstream, although the parliamentary legislation stands, but the government has not empowered it. Then coming to the upstream regulator, DGH, uh, DGH uh, should be given more powers. In fact, the uh, stipulation was that the management committee will consist of only technical and financial people. Yeah. I 
I understand now the government has also nominated its uh, watchdog there in the management committee. Then the DGH should be able to manage the management committee and all the disputes should be resolved in a manner which is uh, known upfront that there will be, if there is a dispute between DGH and the promoter in the management committee, then there will be an expert technical committee which will resolve. Right. In this manner, these things can be easily settled. But uh, I would like to go back to the point regarding um, self-sufficiency. I think we have got carried away by the minister's statement that we will become self-sufficient and might even want to export. I would like to say that as far as the crude is concerned, let us leave aside gas for a moment. Yeah. As far as crude is concerned, we have always said that it will be sold at international prices. But the largest crude discovery is Cairns, and that is pre-NELF round, not yeah. even NELF. Yeah. So nine rounds of NELF have not found any major crude discovery. So the NELF has found only gas discovery, and there, unfortunately, we got stuck in the pricing and in the distribution thing. If we have the same uh, position here, that uh, the operator share, operator is free to sell, and get any price that he uh, can get. So there also there will be incentive. We are moving towards that now slowly uh, by revision of the gas prices. Yeah. But the government uh, getting into the micromanagement, <laughs> now these things are a little deterrent because uh, you know the large companies don't like this kind of micromanagement. Yeah, I, I, I agree with and you. They have the technology, they have the risk capital and they have yeah. the resource. On that note, we will take another quick break but when we return we continue our conversation on energizing India, an interesting conversation on the future of the hydrocarbon sector in India. That more when we return. GE and CNBC TV 18 present Energizing India. Welcome back. You're watching our special series, Energizing India, brought to you in association with GE. Bipul, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, how India is not really going to be energy self-sufficient. We will have to look outside as far as meeting our energy requirements and our energy needs are concerned. China has clearly taken the lead there, whether it is investing in uh, assets in Africa or anywhere else in the world. Why do you think India has held back? Well, I think... Um... <clears throat> I'm actually cautiously optimistic. Uh, my, my sense is that uh, a lot has happened in the last uh, three or four years. If you look at the sizes of deals that have started to happen mm. uh, by Indian companies outside, uh, they are quite substantial. Uh, also, if you look at what's happening in LNG, uh, I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but uh, the changes that are happening in the global LNG industry today mm. uh, as a result of uh, Henry Hub lower-priced gas from America uh, getting through liquefaction and finding its way eventually into India. That's really the, uh, was pioneered by yeah. India. Yeah. So, so I think two or three of the first four deals have really been done by Indian companies. So mm. I think we, are, we probably were, were slow off the block, but are probably catching up quite rapidly. But, but let me come to yeah. you, Vikram Mehta, yeah. since we are talking about the future, and there have been several big ticket decisions that have been taken with regards to uh, shale gas policy, CBM, and so on and so forth. How confident are you feeling about those? I don't, I don't have any doubts that we have substantive reserves uh, of shale gas, shale oil, uh, and other con unconventionals. But my concern is that the monetization of these reserves requires us to overcome certain above-the-ground uh, problems, whether it is to do with the environmental approvals, whether it's to do with access to water, whether it's to do with the relationships between the center and the state, yeah. these, and whether it's to do with the availability of, uh, of, a, of a service industry that can provide a seamless support system to a very intensive drilling program. These are issues that will be critical determinants of success. So we don't have any of them sorted mm -hmm. out yet. So one, there's one thing to say that we have identified Prognosticate, prognosticated reserves of shale gas of, let's say, 200 billion TCF. Another thing to actually convert those prognosticated yeah. reserves to probable reserves. And then a third problem, of course, is to be able to bring those reserves to the surface. So I actually would 
uh, look at the future of our hydrocarbon uh, uh, sector between now and say 2020 or 2025 without the shale gas entering okay. the equation, not because I don't want it to, but because <laughs> I think we are being over optimistic in overcoming these above ground factors. Vipul, would you agree with that or, or, or do you believe that perhaps he's being a tad too pessimistic? Uh, I, I think, you know, the, uh, as, 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 as Vikram well knows, the oil industry is a, is a long term game. You can change very little in five years. Yeah. You can change a few things in 10, but in 15 years you can change almost anything. On shale... In the, India, really? Uh, in, in, <laughs> in, 50, in 15 years, well, uh, yeah. Uh, on shale specifically, uh, the reality is we don't know what the reserves are. And as Vikram rightly said, uh, estimates are all over the place. But I think what's important is to get started and make sure there's sufficient drilling activity going on in shale. Okay. Uh, would you agree? Should we discount shale at least for the next uh, 10 to 15 years? Well, I kind of tend to agree with what Mr. Mehta is saying. In terms of, I think we need to prioritize. We can't be possibly playing all fronts at the same time. <clears throat> Clearly, the offshore seems to be a here and now opportunity which we must exploit to the fullest as and quickly we as possible. So far. And we haven't so far. Yeah. Some framework by which the public-private partnership, especially when it comes to areas of technology, can be formed. Hmm. When you have such high-end and deep-end technology that's at play, you can't possibly boil that down to the least cost, et cetera, yeah. which are the usual metrics, metrics of measuring yeah. Yeah. by which you, you decide on how to go ahead. Speed, technology, many things are done for the first time. Mm. Co-creation of solutions. These are areas where I think we need to find innovative ways of, for the government to work along with the private mm. sector. I don't and think we've done that. And which could certainly help recovery rates as well as productivity. Oh, absolutely. It will bring costs how down. Far, how, what is the gap if you compare us to, say, uh, you know, people in, in China, since we've been talking about Norway, in terms of recovery and productivity? Oh, there's, there's a huge gap. I'm, I'm, at, the, at one end of the spectrum is the basic premise. that you trust the people who are actually exploring and so on, that they're doing the best job. You don't need to, as Mr. Tripathi again said, micromanage what they're doing, even question the amount of food that is being purchased for the canteens and so on and so forth. I mean, so I think some way we need to believe and trust in industry to come out with innovative solutions and create a framework whereby we're able to solve these problems. On that note, we'll take another quick break, but when we return, we continue our conversation here on Energizing India, brought to you in association with G. GE and CNBC TV 18 present Energizing India. Welcome back. You're watching our special series, Energizing India. We're talking about the policy imperatives for the oil and gas sector. Uh, Bikram Mehta, uh, you know, essentially it really seems to boil down to a trust deficit. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about public-private partnership. Our contracts have been based on the principles of public-private partnership. But the trust deficit has come in the way. It's only in the last four or five years that this deficit has mounted. So it is not a structural problem. It's not something that's inherent in the nature of the relationship between the private sector and the public sector, or between the government and the contractors. It can be redeemed, It can and it will be redeemed in my view. Uh, the issue really is to make sure that we don't tinker with the system that has worked. And if I just go back to the revenue, the, the issue about revenue sharing versus cost sharing, my own personal view is that's a kind of tinkering that's only going to upset the apple cart. We should, the production sharing system has worked, the cost recovery system does work, and we should ensure that we don't tamper with a system that will eventually attract risk capital into the deep, very geologically complex offshore, offshore basins that need to be explored. A revenue system will not have that same incentive structure to attract big money into into, the, uh, into these basins. So I would really say the trust deficit does exist. It can be bridged. It requires us to be absolutely clear about what needs to be done. We should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but you're also saying don't tinker around too much with the way that P PSCs have been worked because that will, in a sense, upset the apple cart. So 
how do we how do we move from here then, Vikramatha? We've got several recommendations that the cabinet is going to consider. The cabinet is going to mull. Uh, prospective PSCs will perhaps have to be changed. But what should the principle then be? The, the, what we need to do is to improve the administration of the PSC. It's not a question of tackling or, or playing around with the fundamental tenets of the PSC. The problem that the private companies have faced is with regard to the administration. The problem that we have faced is that contract structures have been tampered with. The problem that we have faced is the pricing mechanism has not been aligned to the market, which is again not in keeping with the contract system, the contract uh, terms that were agreed. Yeah. So we need to actually go back to the status quo ante, okay. streamline the administration of the, uh, of the PSC, respect the terms that we have agreed with the contractors, do not play around with the fiscal regime, and having said all that, keep, keep in mind the fact that the, the technology is evolving, the business environment is evolving, and the competitive conditions are tightening up, so we could look at ensuring that within the framework of the production sharing contract, we actually make the, the fiscal terms, the commercial terms, more competitive. So that's what needs to be done. Vipul, uh, would you agree with Vikram Mehta that in principle you don't really need to tinker around with the structure of the PSC? It's the administration that requires much more attention. Yes, yes I would agree. I'd also add that uh, there may be some... Uh, tinkering with the PSC itself that's required to, to provide some more flexibilities to uh, enable the, the management committees to take the decisions that they need to take. Mr. Agarwala? The same, same views. And I think just a better appreciation of the technology that we'll get into, because we are getting into more and more difficult areas, mm. an appreciation from even the administrative side of understanding technology and that it comes at a certain price. And then in whatever form or fashion that can get paid for, but I think that is indeed important. How difficult is it to sell the idea? Are you facing that as, as the biggest challenge today? Well, at one level, I think the people who actually know the business, who are actually into exploration and so on, they do have a deep appreciation for technology. The challenge is to understand that it comes at a price and the price therefore needs to be recovered, that this is a risky game, that you're not going to succeed 100% of the time and therefore there are certain hidden costs. And what I said earlier, which is that you can actually co-create certain yeah. very innovative solutions which might not have been done earlier. And therefore, one doesn't always have to look for precedent hmm. to actually solve a problem. On that note, it's time for us to take another break. When we return, we continue our conversation on Energizing India. GE and CNBC TV 18 present Energizing India. Okay, uh, on, on the issue of technology being a catalyst, Mr. Lango, let me get your thoughts in on that. I think number one, if you look at the figure on how much of R&D investment that take place on Indian uh, upstream oil and gas sector is, 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 is virtually nothing. To catch up, one does not have to invest in R&D, but one need to go out and seek technologies which can find solution to some of the challenges in business. For example, when we discovered Mangala crude, one of the important challenge for us is how do we make this high pore point crude to flow, uh, which means you need to adopt a technology called heating, heat trace, tracer technology, which is simply uh, how do you keep this crude oil continuously heated. Uh, from the wellhead to the uh, refinery column as such. So we went around the world, found where such technology exists, brought it in India and built the world's longest heated pipeline uh, in from Barmer to Gujarat. Number two is uh, when you uh, re uh, very, very recently we have decided to go for what is called enhanced oil recovery technology. In enhanced oil recovery technology, what you do is instead of injecting water, you put inject polymer along with that to improve your recovery uh, from the existing reservoir. We are looking at uh, 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 improving the recovery factors between 10 to 15 percent from our Mangla field by applying this technology. So 
it is about going out finding technology which has worked in other parts of the world and bringing it to your own field and making it work. Uh, that's a good point that you're making there in terms of being able to improve those recovery rates. But also, Mr. Elango, uh, Mr. Agarwala here was talking about the need to set up infrastructure, especially when we're talking about the age of gas. Uh, what do you believe needs to be done in order to do that, to create a denser network? To really use gas, you need a wide network of pipeline. Uh, if we create the network of pipeline, which has been successfully done in Gujarat, for example, in Gujarat, in the primary energy mix, the share of gas is roughly 25%, whereas the national average is 9%. In Middle East, it is 50%. In US, it is 30%. So there is scope, uh, not only scope, it's extremely critical for the country to create the infrastructure that is required to transport gas. Then gas is freely available and it is available in abundance for this country to choose multiple options. All right, uh, S.C. Tripathi, I'm going to let you have the final say as far as the future of the hydrocarbon sector uh, in India is concerned because you've, you know the inner workings of the government and a lot of what could possibly happen in this sector is going to be linked to how the government decides to approach this sector. So, uh, you know, sum up for us uh, the policy imperatives and how confident you feel that we will actually be able to get to that vision uh, that the government has articulated for the sector. In my view... They should first uh, initiate the reforms from uh, downstream, just as in power sector they have not done and power sector is suffering for, for want of that. Downstream, the regulator should be free and the market prices should be allowed. Uh, there can be only a short period of time, transition period, for going to the market-related pricing. And if the government thereafter continues to give subsidy, it is government's choice. They should do it directly, maybe in kerosene and maybe in... Uh, LPG, but diesel should be freed and it should be market related. Then coming to gas, you see the availability of gas must be increased. Why in Gujarat 25% is the primary energy share of gas? Gas is environmentally friendly, easy to handle. Availability has to be increased. Availability will increase if we give market related prices to gas. We are not giving market related prices and we have all kinds of uh, restrictions on whom to sell, what to sell. You see, all the whole of the country will not develop at the same rate at the same point of time. Therefore, we have to understand that it will be a spread effect from Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and maybe some other states will, will develop faster right. and coastal states where the gas can be brought in. And gas infrastructure must be put in place. So as far as the upstream is concerned, I think the contracts must be honored. All those contracts which have been written and signed, they must be honored. And somebody should stand up and say that we'll honor these contracts, whatever CAG, CVC opinion may be, but this was our opinion, this is the way they were signed, and they will be honored. In future, yes, we have had so much of uh, dispute in relation to one particular contract that in future it is all right. You say that they will only do revenue sharing and the cost is your, your burden. Whether you meet with success or you don't meet with success, the yeah. cost will be entirely to your account. We are not going to share it. We will only share the output and that is the revenue. So I think transparency will come. You have upfront all these things. And, first, and also the government needs to build a partnership among its own departments first. And then build partnership with the private sector, the, those, particularly the private sector that has the technology and that has the risk capital. So that is the recommendation I would like Well, to. I think that pretty much sums up what we actually need to do to nurture this sector in India. Transparency, uh, more appreciation of the needs of the country, more appreciation of the needs of the private sector, uh, a trust deficit that has been built over the last couple of years, doing away with that, and of course trying to attract not just foreign direct investment, but also technology in the sector to improve productivity and recovery rates. My many thanks to our panelists for joining us here on this very special special discussion energizing India. Vikram Mehta, S.E. Tripathi, Vipul Tuli, Banmani Agarwala, thank you very much for joining us. Mr. Lango, appreciate you joining us here as well. We will uh, return with more conversation on CNBC TV 18. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye and many thanks for watching. Innovate. 
en Facebook.